man who wrote a, a superb column on NJ.com, Muhammad Ali, why they called him the greatest and why I called him my friend, a sports journalist with the Newark Star-Ledger since the early 50s. Covered Ali for five decades. Jerry Eisenberg joining us here on The Rich Eisen Show. How are you, Jerry? Uh, well, I'm like everybody else who knew him, uh, but uh, at least we get a chance to tell what he was really like. So, Jerry, um, why did uh, they call Muhammad Ali the greatest in your estimation? They didn't. He did. And when he <laughs> says something, and they, <laughs> they listen, and they call it to him, too. It, you know, the interesting thing about the greatest to me is the, 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 the phrase uh, is that was he the greatest boxer I ever saw? Absolutely not. Was he the greatest heavyweight I saw? Absolutely not. But he was the greatest athlete outside of Pele, and Pele was not really known here the way he is, so let's forget Pele. Greatest athlete I ever knew who impacted on the country and the world. His influence was enormous. When did you first meet him, Jerry? 1960, Rome Olympics. He's sitting on the steps in the Olympic Village, and he's got the gold medal, light heavyweight medal, uh, you know, around his neck. He's holding it. And, yeah, you know, you've been in the village. of All these athletes keep going by, going by. You hear a million languages spoken. And he's yelling, I'm the best. You see the medal? I'm the best. I'm going to get better. I'm going to be the best in the world. I'm going to be. And I would say probably 70% of people who were by couldn't understand a word he was saying. But what I noticed was... The female athletes always took about four steps, stopped it, and looked over their shoulder to see who, uh, take another look at him. And I said, this is a guy worth watching. And then you traveled the world with him, Jerry? Did you see him? Oh, yeah. Well, I was in Manila. I was in, uh, no, yeah, put it his way. He said, you, he said, you all just be stuck in some big dusty city and all that. I took you guys around the world. And he certainly did. I was with him in England. I was with him in Malaysia. I was with him in Zaire. I was with him in Manila. Um, and I don't even remember the other places off the top of my head. But, yeah, he did, we did see the world with Rally. So what, I mean, this is also a time where there was no, obviously, Internet, social media, uh, real-time news. Uh, why did he get so big? Why was he so popular in all four corners of the Well, earth, you know, Jerry? you got to take. The many lives of Muhammad Ali to answer that question. The first part is he was the loudmouth kid trying to win the world championship, had no chance at all. It was he was a seven to one underdog. Uh, and the people were amused by what he said or they were angered by what he said. This had nothing to do with the army, the war, or anything else. It had to do with the guy who brags that American athletes are supposed to be self effacing and quiet and everything else. So in fact, in Joe DiMaggio, they mistook that for personality. But in his sense, uh, he caught fire with them. And then he won, and then the first thing that happened after he won, he announced that he was a member of the Nation of Islam. And even that changed later on when he became a Sunni Muslim. But the point is, that was such a shock to people in this country, who knew very, most white people knew very little about the Nation of Islam. And, and uh, he comes in the day after he beats him, and he says, the, the black ants stay with the black ants, the red ants stay with the red ants, the kangaroos live with the kangaroos, you know. And I don't want to integrate, I don't want to go where I'm not wanted, and you don't want me, that's okay. And, and the main thing is, from now on, you call me uh, Cassius X because you're not going to use my slave name. And that angered a lot of people. And... Um, and really improperly so at that point. But then, you know, it, it was like a snowball that was going downhill. Everything he said became one thing when he might have meant something else. And on the other hand, he said some things he shouldn't have said because he was told to say them. And so even becoming the guy that part of America loved to hate was more notoriety. Then came the war. And that, you know, I don't have to tell you. And we had we had hard hats and, yep, and, 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 uh, Yuppies, uh, not yuppies, hard yeah. hats and hippies yeah. fighting in Times Square. Uh, uh, the country, I'm 85 years old. I've never seen this country so divided except the early years of the Depression when I was a little kid. And he came through that. But the thing about Ali was, people don't understand, he never told anybody don't go in the Army. He never told anybody don't go fight that war. He said, this is what I'm going to do, and it's my religion. 
and it's my religious belief, and this is what's going to happen. And I'll tell you that the day that I began to believe he was willing to go to prison if necessary. I, you remember Mayor Daly chased the Terrell Alley fight out of Chicago. Mm -hmm. Terrell said, well, I won't fight him. I'll go join that tournament, and I'll win the title, and so I don't need him. Alley went to Canada. And he fought George Favaro, a lovely guy, and I would say maybe a middle echelon heavyweight. He was no match for Ali, of course. So I just I went up to Canada, and I'm walking in uh, into the Sully's AC gym. And I want to tell you, Rich, if you and I ever direct the movie, we're going to make it in that gym. It is the prototype of every ugly, broken-down movie gym you ever saw. Mm -hmm. We go up the creaky stairs. The windows are so dirty you can barely see the street below. And it's a 15-year-old, 16-year-old kid biting him out a heavy bag, and nobody's in the gym. And I said, where are they? And he says, in the back. And I walk in the back. Now he's on the table, rubbing table. Luis from uh, Sharia, the Cuban exile, is giving him a massage. How he looks at him and says, what are you doing here? I said, well, somebody said there was a fight. <laughs> he said, you know this not my of a fight. I said, well, how and I have to tell you the truth? Uh, I am here because it is a heavyweight title. But beyond that, can, the Canadian government is giving political asylum to young American men who feel they're opposed to the war and cannot, cannot stay in the country. So I'm here because I want to see if you're going home. We were friends for 50 years. It's the only argument we ever had. No kidding. It wasn't an argument. I mean, I was listening and he was yelling. He jumps off the table. He gets in my face. And these are the exact words he said. That's my birth country. America's my birth country. No one's going to chase me out of my birth country. And I don't make the laws here, and I know that. You know that. And, and if I have to go to jail, I will go to jail because a lot, a lot of Elijah Muhammad went to jail World War II. I will go to jail out of my religious thoughts. But I'm telling you right now, I'm going home. And you tell everybody else in case they don't know it. And in that instant, I was absolutely convinced that he would be... Um, the, um, uh, that he would go to jail if he had to. Muhammad Ali's remembrance, along with Jerry Eisenberg here, who covered Ali for five decades in our weekly uh, Continental for What You Do segment. Did he ever have any regrets in any quiet moments that you shared with him while traveling or just talking or sharing a meal? Did he ever have any regrets? Yes. I'm picking back now. It's a, it, that's an excellent question. No one has ever asked me that. I don't think he ever did, because I think... See, i got to explain something about him, and, and it's the best way to understand him. And he's a complex... He, was a, he wasn't a genius. He wasn't the devil uh, incarnate. He wasn't a guardian angel. Saying that. He was Muhammad Ali, and that required several dimensions of life. Mm -hmm. You know, you grew up and matured. I grew up and matured. He did not. He didn't mature. He evolved. Everything that he ever believed, he thought over again, and he rethought, and he rethought. And the Muhammad Ali of the, uh, at age 40 was not the Muhammad Ali at age 19. And so it went. And, and I think when he felt he was wrong about something, he would say it. You know, one of the most interesting things is uh, he was going to fight Ken Norton in, in New York City at the United States. And he's training at the, at the Grossings, and, uh, at the Concord. And we're sitting in the rain, and I remember it like it was yesterday. It was drizzling, but it's, you know, in the summer when you drizzle, kind of, it, it's not an irritant so much. It's like part of the atmosphere, and mm -hmm. it's, it, you can smell the ozone. And he's got on the ugliest vertical striped shirt I have ever seen in my life. And while I'm interviewing him, he's combing his hair. And but we talk about capitalism. We talk about integration, segregation. We talk about all these things. It's really it's for the BBC, and it's less a boxing interview than more an Ali interview. Mm -hmm. And now we get to the point where I say to him, "Okay, tell me about the Black Panthers." And he didn't put them down, but he he made everything very clear. He said, "You know, they don't understand. Their time is over. They don't understand that." One day you and I are going to see black and white being significant colors. And the main color, even as it starts to be now, is green. And then because he's out of here, and I'm going to get myself a lot of it. <laughs> when was the last time you saw him? When did you say goodbye, Jerry? I 
never said goodbye, and I will, I'll, I, I will, this I will explain. Uh, about, uh, I hadn't seen him for, I moved to Nevada, and I hadn't seen him for some time, and about three years ago, Gene Choi, who was managed to have a camp that he had, and who was a good friend of his, and a good friend of mine, we were like the Gleesham threesome, and Choi said, I'm going down there, and, uh, if he, if he, was in, he was in Arizona then, I think. He said, I'm going down there, and uh, why don't you come with me? And I said, I don't know, Gene. I don't think I'm going to go. And my wife, who was standing behind me, said, hey, if you don't go, you, you will regret this the rest of your life. And I said, you know what? I'm afraid if I do go, I will regret this the rest of my life. Mm. Because I have an image of him. That stays in my mind whenever, if you ask me how, I will always remember him. And, it, and, and it's all of its present tense because I cannot accept the fact that he is now past tense. But there was the fight in Zaire, not the winning of the fight, not the conduct of the fight, not even the glamour and the, uh, or the exotic allure of Africa. He wins the fight. He leaves. We get a hot, horrendous downpour of rain. If it happened an, earlier, an hour earlier, there'd have been no fight. And by the time we can get out of this run-down soccer stadium and get on a bus and go back to the military compound where we're all staying, the sun is coming up. And I'm with somebody, and I, don't even, I, I think it was Dave Anderson, because Dave was at the fight, but I, I just don't quite remember. But I said to the guy, you know, it was so rushed today. It was such, a, yeah, it was such an important moment. I really got to get ready and do a better job tomorrow. So let's go look for him. And, I, and the guy said to me, you know, this is about 30,000 acres on this boat. How are we going to find I said, the only place I think I will look for him is by the river. We get down by the river, and there he is. Now, he doesn't know we're there. We're about 50 yards from him, and he is facing the water, looking right across it, at what was once French Congo, and now I think it's People's Republic of Congo. And he seems like he's standing there for hours. Actually, he's here about five minutes. And he's staring, he's staring. And suddenly, and all, remember, that all we could see is the river and Ali, and we can't hear anything. It's dead silence. Suddenly, both of his arms shoot up in the air in the rocky pose. Now, he's not on stage. There's nobody there to see it, he thinks. And he holds that pose, and he turns around, and he starts to walk back up. And he sees us, and he gets to us. He says, fellas, he says, I can't explain to you how I felt tonight. And if I could, I don't think you'd understand it. But this is the most important night of my life so far. And I understood that because he had a fight his way back. I mean, all these things. He couldn't mm -hmm. get fights when he was when he was exiled. He, things were against him. He had to fight, fight, fight. But when he finally got into fight, he became a, an actor for a week or, or actually a month till the show closed. Big Buck White, and he sang a song called Mighty Whitey. He, uh, he, he sold Muhammad Speaks newspapers on the street. He did went on a lecture tour and spoke to kids in college uh, and for very little money. And the deal was... Everything was to get back, get back. And when he finally gets back, and Frazier's on his uh, radar, Frazier's not the champion anymore, so he's got to fight like 12, 13, 14 other guys. And then he finally gets to Africa, and Africa's the perfect setting for him anyway. But the whole point of it is he was alone that night. He had his arms pointed toward the heavens. He didn't move a muscle. He was young. He was muscular. We had just seen him in, in one of his greatest hours. And I thought to myself, look at him. In this moment, he is the king of the world. And that's how I'm going to remember him. Jerry, I grew up in Staten Island. I read you at the Newark Star-Ledger. I was a Staten Island advanced reporter for three years. Yeah. Part of the same organization as the Newark Star-Ledger. I've read you for years. I'm a big fan, and I am honored to have you on this show and to have you share your stories with my viewership and listenership. I cannot thank you enough. Thank you. Well, I'm pleased, really, to be on this show, number one. Thanks, Jerry. I'm 85. I'm pleased to be anywhere. <laughs> but I'm also pleased uh, uh, 
that people like you get me a chance. I mean, I could speak for hours, and, and, and you could probably listen for hours. To give you a chance to tell you what kind of a person he really was. Mm. Amazing guy. The only guy outside of Joe DiMaggio I ever knew, if he stepped into a room, everything stopped in the room. Uh, the guy who, when he was a little kid, and when he was with older people, and when he was alone, he was at his best. He, he was a very compassionate man. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the things I remember about him was the Holmes fight, which I didn't want him to fight, and we all suffered through it, and he didn't even throw a punch, I don't think, one punch maybe. And after the fight was over, and I wandered around Caesars and whatever, and now it's 3 o'clock in the morning, and I walk into the men's room, and an elderly Afro-American guy is handing me a towel. And I say elderly. Today, he'd be probably 10, uh, he'd be much younger than me. But in those <laughs> days, I was young and he was old. Yes. And I said, do you mind if I ask you a question? Did you bet money on this fight? He said, yes, I did. I said, well, who did you bet on? He looked me in the eye and he said, I bet on the man who gave me dignity. Mm. And it's interesting because, yeah, he gave black people dignity, at least through their eyes. But... On the, on the other hand, he gave a lot of people dignity because of this evolving of his. He showed you can change your mind about things. He showed that nothing is cast in stone as long as you keep growing. And it, it was a wonderful lesson. You know, this guy, there was a time they were going to take the members of an old a Jewish old age home in Bronx and put them out because it was snowing. It was December. And it's a true story. And they didn't have the money to settle up with the guy. He said, you, you got to do it. And Ali hears the news on, on uh, the news of this on television. And he says to Kilroy, come on. He says, he's in New York. He's going to fight Shavers on Monday. This is Thursday. And they go up there and he ring the bell. And the rabbi says, what are you doing here? Eric? I hear you got some problems. He says, yeah, well, we do. Blah, 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 blah. And Ali says, how much money do you need? to finish the year, and he tells him the figure. He turns to Phil he says, pull out the check, but write, write a check for the X amount of dollars. And Gene says, well, I don't even know who we are. Who do I make this out? And Ali being out, he says, make it out to the Jews. I don't know. Ask him. So he writes the check. I can tell you, I won't tell you the figure, but I will tell you the check was in excess of $100,000. He hands it to the rabbi, and then because he's Ali, you know, he has to be Ali, and the old people are picking around the corner. I'm sure you know he has to be Ali. He turns around, hands it out a check, takes five steps toward the door as though Cecil beat the mill with direct. He just stops, pivots, faces the guy, points at him, and says, Okay, now next year, go to the Jews and get the money. They got a lot of money. <laughs> that was Ali. Jerry, thanks for calling in. Congratulations on your International uh, Boxing listen, Hall of Fame induction. Thanks for letting me tell the truth. Of course, Jerry. You're the best. It's Jerry Eisenberg here on The Rich Eisen Show. The Rich Eisen Show, weekdays at noon Eastern on Audience.